All right, good afternoon. I'd like to go over three of the articles I've asked you to read. <clears throat> this was before spring break, so this would be a good refresher. Um, so let's let's take a look here. You don't want to grab these articles uh, if you printed them out, or at least I guess maybe write a thing or two down. I don't know. Whatever works for you. All right, the first article here. Article here is Edward Tolman in Cognitive Maps. The next, the second one will be Gordon Paul and SDT, uh, Learning and Theory in the Clinic. And then the last one, Albert Bandura, Invitation in Social Learning. All right, Edward Tolman. So he's using rats here. Um, and he's his kind of thinking to start this experiment. He says, all right, so let's, let's, the behaviorist remember said, we don't care what the rat is thinking. We only care what the rat is doing. Remember John Watson, the behaviorist said that. He said, you know, the rat in the maze, why, you know, why do we care what the rat's thinking? And obviously Skinner agreed with that. But to men like Edward Tolman, he insisted that we have to consider what's going on inside the animal. And this is, this is his reasoning. He says, all right, how can we really understand behavior unless we consider what's going on in the animal's head? So if the, if the, if the rat's not pressing the lever, is it because he's not hungry? Is it because he doesn't really understand the lever pre, uh, pressing procedure? Does it mean that the rat lacks motivation? Um, does it mean that the rat doesn't really believe pressing the lever will give food? We don't know the answer if the rat's not pressing the lever. And so he says, these clearly are quite different, though the behavior is the same. So he calls these intervening variables, meaning between the thought and the action, the actual behavior, what, it, what intervenes? And that's things like motivation. Etc. that he identified. And so he uh, looked at this experiment where you put a rat in a maze like this. It's got a circular room, and then the rat would go from C to D to E to F, and then the food would be at G. And he would run the rat through this five times. And then he would put a rat in this second apparatus with, where the original path is blocked. And the question was, are they going to take the next the next nearest route to the center thinking the food was down that route just very similar path or would the rat have a cognitive map a kind of a a sense of direction that says even though i took a left turn a right turn a right turn to get way over here is there a direct if i can't go up the center like i used to do can i take a more direct path right to g and so that's what Tolman was measuring. So we put the rat here, it would go, it would see this is blocked. And then some rats did try this left path. We can see the percentages up here. Uh, no one took the far left pass, but you can see the most of the rats, 36% uh, took the path that led most directly to where the food had been. And so Tolman's argument from this is that the rats obviously were learning spatially where that food was, even though they were took an ind indirect route to it. And so when put in this other maze, that's why 36 of them took path six. And so that he calls that their cognitive map. This is an evidence of latent learning, learning that's not useful. Um, originally, so in this case, having a cognitive map of where that food was at wasn't really rewarded for the rats. But then in this experiment shows that they did actually have um, the learning. Um, then looking down here, it says rats with damage in the hippocampal area of the brain, the hippocampus, a structure in the forebrain below the cerebral cortex are not good at this. They don't remember. Uh, damage to the hippocampus often means a uh, uh, 
misfunctioning short-term memory. And he also showed that there are different factors that contribute to how well a rat can learn this cognitive map. He mentions in here that if they're really, really hungry, they don't learn very well. And if you run them down the original maze, so he did five times, but if you ran them down here a whole bunch of times, uh, that they'd get cemented into like, this is the way I have to go. And that's, that's a, something we can learn from too, because often in our minds, if we problem solve the same way over and over, we're less apt to try different problem solving strategies. We get conditioned into them. So maybe if you always study one night before a test and you've done that year after year after year after year after year, and now you're a senior or junior in high school. And uh, even if you don't do the greatest, you're still doing the same thing. Well, it's gonna be hard to change. And maybe you should change because research shows that more exposure is better. All right, let's move on to the next article. This was rather lengthy. So you had some questions to answer from this. All right, so what's going on here is we're looking at how to apply Pavlov's classical conditioning uh, in a human study. And so the issue here is a phobia. Phobia is an irrational fear. In this case, we're looking at the fear of public speaking. So they took some college kids um, I want to say from the University of Illinois, but I can't remember. And they identified uh, 74 kids after a battery of testing uh, who were severely fearful of public speaking. And so the goal was can we use ideas from classical conditioning? to help these kids using something called systematic desensitization therapy. And the idea here is you condition relaxation. So first you have to teach these kids how to, how to deeply relax. And then we imagine ourselves through the day of giving a public speak, uh, speech. So the morning of the day, the beginning of the class period, how you feel when you're approaching the, be the front of the room. And in each situation, so you think, okay, it's the morning of the speech. How would I feel? I'd be, as soon as I start thinking about the speech, maybe I'm nervous. Maybe I don't want to eat breakfast. So then he'd say, okay, now deeply relax. Okay, mission accomplished. All right, now it's the beginning of class. You know you're the fourth one to speak, let's say. Are you nervous? How do you feel? Oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm very nervous. Okay, so now deeply relax. And so we, you're going to do that through every, through the day up to your speech. Now you're in front of the class, etc. cetera. And um, you need to relax each time. So this is an example of what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. There's a cognitive component, the imagining, right? You can't actually use this technique. Uh, you can't teach this type of conditioning in reality, because meaning it's not like Pavlov with the meat and the dog and the bell, because otherwise you'd have to give dozens of public speeches where you were like trying to stop in the speech and relax, and that would just be a mess. And some people are so fearful of public speaking, they, 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 they couldn't learn the relaxation thing. No, so you have to imagine it. That's the cognitive part, and then the behavior is changing your your fear, your physiological behavior that can be measured. So CBT, cognitive behavior, cognitive behavioral therapy, extremely important in psychology. It's not just here in public speaking. It's also used to treat people with depression and anxiety, and it's just incredibly useful therapy technique that's kind of like the main one that's being used uh, today. So in many ways, Gordon Paul was a pioneer of this. Uh, another thing to think about is spontaneous improvement. Many people will improve um, 
public speaking without any treatment. So at the beginning of the class, they might be really fearful, but after they do it, they get some experience, they get some encouragement, they might get a lot better at public speaking and not having fear without any help. So we call this spontaneous improvement. So that has to be factored in. Um, all right, and the ethical question. In this case, so we've, we've been kind of fooling around with this because we always say, well, is this ethical? Is it ethical in this case to apply a novel treatment to patients that could maybe not work? Is it, is it ethical to, if we have a technique that really works, to have a control group that's not getting any treatment and obviously they need treatment. And he says, well, it's ethical because we don't know if our technique's gonna work yet. So we have one group gets treatment, the other does not. So this is different ways that this could be done. Uh, for one group, but not the other, someone is listening and tending to their problems, caring for them. And this could be beneficial with no specific treatment. One, one group expects to get better, the other does not. So that's that expectation bias. And for one group, not the other, a therapist might expect improvement. And that, can, that expectation bias can factor in. So here's how it's classical conditioning, right? You got a feared situation, which leads to fear, in this case, of speaking. And now we want to pair the feared situation with relaxation, which will lead to relaxation. So when you're actually in the fearful situation, the public speaking, you relax. So he sets this up in a double line study. It was the University of Illinois. Um, and so you've got these three different categories. Um, he said there's five treatment, only three of them he talks about here. Uh, so SDT, the classical conditioning one, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then insight oriented psychotherapy, and then attention placebo. So the insight condition was based on psychotherapy, which is Sigmund Freud. And many, this was kind of very popular. This was the popular way to do phobia therapy at the time. And then the third group, attention placebo, you get to take an actual pill, plus you're doing other things that are supposed to help you cope with stress. And then he had, he used three different behavioral markers here. He asked his patients to rate their anxiety, he asked, uh, well, I actually took behavioral measurements like heartbeat, et cetera. And then he looked at, he had people in the audience measuring them. Are you rocking the podium back and forth? Are you using a lot of verbal pauses? Are your hands going haywire ah, when you're talking? You've seen a lot of this if you've taken speech class, how some people get up there and next thing you know, the they're doing all kinds of strange things. All right, so he used all of these because they're all flawed, but as you read, putting them all together gave him kind of an idea of how all these things worked. And so here are the results. It says that SDD produced greater anxiety reduction than either insight-oriented psychotherapy or attention placebo. It says for different measures, the percentage is raised from 87 to 100% as far as cases significantly improved. So there was a very high success rate for SDT, much higher than the insight, the kind of the popular method of the day, where only just over half of the people said they improved versus the placebo, which in some ways had a higher success than the insight, which is kind of strange. So these therapists who were skeptical, and he goes through that, he says that this process could have been derailed because the therapists had to be trained in using SDT and they thought that the insight method was better um, but it actually showed that SDT worked in spite of that. So the big idea here is that you can use classical conditioning for lots of things in this case getting over the phobia of public speaking but also that cognitive behavioral therapy is a real uh, exciting, effective therapy option. So that's the Gordon Paul article. And then last but not least, of course, Albert Bandura, Imitation of Social Learning. So you watch this video, the Bobo Head Doll, that I posted, hopefully.
and we're looking at imitation social learning. So the idea was you have these kids watch someone beat up a Bobo doll, this kind of inflated thing that you can smack down and it pops back up. You can punch it, kick it, they use bad language or some sort of aggressive language. And then the, the kids, the, the idea was how will the kids or will the kids imitate this? And what he found was that imitation is more likely if the model is rewarded for behavior rather than punish. So if you watch someone beat up a bull doll and they're rewarded for that in some way, the kid's more likely to model, to imitate that. However, if you punish the adult model or the model who's beating up the doll, then they're less likely to do that behavior. And oh, it says if the model has a high status, if and if the model is similar to the child. So if you watch like someone who's cool who's doing this, it's different than if someone on the fringe, I suppose. And then it goes on to say that um, participants were offered attractive rewards if they would do what they had seen the model do, and this made imitation more likely even if the model was punished. So in other words, if you tell a if you a kid done watch some violent things, then you say, and and even if someone was punished for doing that, if the the kid then goes out and you say, okay, we're going to reward you for doing this thing you just watched someone get punished for, the kid inhibition's gone. They're going to be imitating that violent behavior. Um, they then in another exam, another uh, experiment, he had three different conditions and the one the child would describe the actions performed by the model a second one they would just watch and a third one they were supposed to count rapidly which was interference we're going to look at memory in chapter seven we're going to study interference and how that messes up memory processes but this is like if you're trying to study for a test and you've got your phone next to you and people keep buzzing in that's interference your lot, your study time is going to be a lot less effective. Or if you do something like, oh, but do my homework where I watch this movie or whatever, and you think that that's not messing with your ability to focus and learn, well, you know it does. You're so much, your mental abilities are so much uh, inhibited. Or if it's like if you're looking at your phone and you're trying to listen to someone in conversation, right? You're, you're using your phone to snub someone. Um, and you act like you can listen to them and play on your phone at the same time. So these are all different ways of interference. But the person, the child who most learned from the model was the one who actually repeated, described what he saw the model doing. So that's why if some of you, it might benefit if you're studying to read your notes out loud or dis describe what you're learning out loud because vocalizing things help you remember it better. Um, then this is just looking at violence in media. So way back in 1993, which doesn't seem that long ago to me, but I guess it was 27 years ago. So I guess that is kind of a long time ago. The average 12 year old had witnessed 100,000 acts of violence on television. And you know it's gonna be so much more now because movies are, are a lot more violent. Video games are a lot more violent. Um, and so people in our culture are getting a steady diet of violence, which means we're just very desensitized to it. And so it talks about that. And we imitate other things like the saxophone example with the Simpsons TV show. And, and we see that all different, all different ways in society. You, you know, if uh, sports figures or other popular media personalities what they wear, what they drive, the books they read. I mean, Oprah has a book club, if you know who Oprah is, or she used to, and she would recommend a book, and then all of a sudden that book would instantly become, uh, sell thousands of copies. Uh, so we're very influenced by, by uh, that type of thing, or many people are influenced. And then another application of imitation in the positive sense is that this can also help people with phobia. So we just looked at Gordon Paul and SDT using classical conditioning 
to help with phobias. And here we're looking at imitation. So in this case, you watch somebody go through actions in small steps. So like, let's say you have a phobia of snakes. So you have someone you're with and that person's like, oh, snakes, not so bad. Here, here's a garter snake. And they pick it up and they hold it. And they, you know, so then maybe they touch it first and then they hold it, whatever. And then you following the lead, oh, this isn't so bad. And you learn from that imitation how to do that. And, you know, um, uh, for example, I have a, a nephew who's um, very active, athletic, strong individual. And uh, I remember distinctly, he came over to our house to play when he was younger and my girls were out by the woodpile catching snakes. They like to do that. And so they have no fear of snakes. They catch snakes. They've been bit by snakes. Um, the Eastern milk snake could be pretty aggressive and he's watching them, but he doesn't, you know, he's kind of scared of snakes. So he comes in and it's like the summer, it's like 90, you know, 80, 90 degrees out there out catching snakes. And he comes and he's like, Hey, do you have any, you know, winter gloves that I can borrow. It's like, why do you need to put, I knew why he wanted them. He wanted them because he didn't want to touch the snake with his bare hands. But uh, like, what? I guess harassed him. Like, why do you want winter gloves in the middle of summer? It's 90 degrees out of your hands cold. I wanted, I wanted, I was being mean. I wanted him to have to explain it. But anyway, so like watching my girls who are younger and smaller than him catch snakes. I mean, that, was some imitation for him to get the idea like, okay, if these girls can do it, I can do it too. And uh, uh, I remember, not that I had a phobia in college, but I remember some of the harder classes I took. I, You know, you look at the syllabus on the first day and it's like all these projects and huge research paper or something, books you have to read, and it might be intimidating. I would always just kind of look around. I'd be like, okay, if these other people can do it, then I can do it. Um, Anyway, okay, so this is another way to conquer phobias. And, and it says here that um, according to one team of reviewers, it is as effective as systematic desensitization therapy using imitation therapy to overcome phobias. And then the last thing, self-efficacy. It's the if he can do it, so can I. Watching a model do something gives you the confidence that you can too. And it says, it turns out that once patients have observed a model, the best predictor of how well they can perform a similar task is the extent to which they now expect that they will be able to do it themselves. It's very important. Uh, the human psyche, you have to be a believer in yourself. If you have a defeatist attitude, it's very difficult to be successful. All right, so hopefully going over these articles, you got a lot out of that. And if you have questions, just go ahead and uh, shoot me an email about any of these readings.